Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Katie Rowley, and I will be your outreach librarian for today's talk, Controlling the Technical Aspects. So a few logistics to get us started. You, as an attendee, are muted. Um, you can ask questions, but you have to put them in the question panel. And you can ask those questions throughout the presentation, but we won't be um, turning them over to the speakers until the end of both presentations presentations today. So please uh, stick with us through both presentations and we will get to those questions. Also, we are recording today's seminar, so if you do need to step away or if you would like to share uh, this presentation with a colleague later on, it'll be posted up on the library's YouTube channel and you can find it there under NOAA Central Library if you search in YouTube. And with that, um, anything you do ask or comment, since we are recording, will also be recorded. Um, that's only used for uh, following up with you if there is a question that isn't answered um, or anything else that is expressly related to this seminar. So with the logistics out of the way, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Julie, who is going to introduce our speakers today. And I hope Julie can unmute. And if not, I will turn it over to Lee. Did that work? Yes, it did. Julie, we can hear you. You're a little quiet, but we can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to thank everybody for uh, participating today. Um, I also want to thank the NOAA Central Library for hosting this seminar and for Lee for connecting um, the Potomac Chapter 2 us. I'm just going to put in a little plug. I would love to see some of the names that are on the attendance today join us in our membership. Um, if you have any questions about that, please ask Lee or myself or visit our website. Um, today we are very excited to be able to um, have two of our travel award winners um, speak to you today about their work. Um, first up, um, uh, well, I don't know if it's first or second, but um, we have Seth, who is um, currently a PhD student at Clemson University. Um, when he won the award, he was actually at East Carolina University. Um, we were able to go, Lee and I were able to uh, see him at that meeting um, and pass on his travel grant. And he was able to um, speak there. Um, and then we also have Vaskar Nepal, who is currently a assistant professor of biology. Congratulations, Vaskar, at Western Illinois University. Um, again, he was a student when he won the award. Um, and so he has just moved on. So congratulations to him. This is a new position for him. Um, also, I wanted to point out that Vaskar um, also served as our newsletter editor. Um, from the time of his award through um, actually still just now. Um, so uh, we appreciate all of the efforts that he's made for our chapter. Um, and so I am now going to turn over the mic to Seth so that he can get started with his presentation. All right. Thank you so much. Uh... First off, I just want to start off by thanking everybody for having an opportunity um, to talk today. Uh, I haven't gotten to give my uh, river herring talk in a little bit. Um, I'm actually uh, in parks, recreation, and tourism right now, so uh, I've moved on more to the social side, but I'm excited whenever I get a chance to uh, talk about my river herring work and environmental DNA because it's all really exciting stuff. And Without the uh, travel award, I wouldn't have gotten to go to the uh, joint meeting of the Wildlife Society and the American Fishery Society, where um, you know I got to network with a lot of amazing people and get some new ideas, a lot of which led to some of the content in this presentation. So uh, I'm really excited to talk about this today. But um, so this is related to my thesis work from East Carolina University, uh, where I was studying uh, river herring in uh, North Carolina rivers specifically how we might be able to eventually use environmental DNA to use that as sort of 
a monitoring technique in these, you know, these vast river systems where it's a logistical nightmare, you know, to have everybody out at every river for the entire spawning season, uh, keeping an eye on these species. So uh, without any further ado, I'll just kind of um, get started here. Let's see. There we go. So I just kind of want to start off by giving you what some of the objectives of this research originally were. So uh, I had four primary objectives I'm kind of going to talk about today. Uh, that would be my main objective in all this was to calculate some preliminary shedding and decay rates for river herring environmental DNA. Uh, now these are going to be more controlled environment rates, you know, things can switch up out in the actual ecosystem, but uh, just to find those kind of preliminary rates. We also wanted to find the relationship between river herring biomass and uh, the species environmental DNA shedding and decay. We wanted to compare the efficacy of two collection and filtration methods for environmental DNA, which would be more of a traditional pump system that we'll get to in a minute and an Andy sampling backpack, which is a product by Smith Root. And then we also wanted to track some trends actually in Eastern North Carolina river systems across the spawning season. So we, I've managed to pack all that into this presentation. Uh, and these are some hypotheses for those. So going into this, what we originally thought was that uh, river herring would shed their DNA at a linear, linear rate and the decay, DNA would actually decay at a similar rate to that. Uh, we believe that eDNA concentrations would increase with increasing biomasses of fish. Uh, we believed that the sampling backpack would be equally effective at collecting environmental DNA as the traditional methods, which would actually be a great help because it's a, it's a very simple closed system. And uh, we also believe that river herring eDNA concentrations will vary across different locations and times throughout the spawning season as the fish move. So before I get started, just a little bit about river herring, uh, their natural history. So when we say river herring, we're actually referring to two separate species, uh, as many of you may know, uh, the alewife and the blueback herring. So these two fish, they're sort of looked at and managed together due to a lot of their similarities. As you can see, they look fairly similar, uh, as well as some genetic similarities. These uh, two species can also interbreed. So whenever we're looking at them, uh, it's quite easy to manage them together. And so they uh, share this zone of sympathy from the Carolinas up into Canada. And so we're looking specifically at Eastern North Carolina rivers where river herring have been in decline for a long time due to, you know, mostly uh, anthropogenic causes, you know, over harvesting, uh, habitat loss, et cetera. So I've described to you the river herring. Now let me get a little bit into environmental DNA. So this is a diagram I've made up to show the concept as simply as possible. So when anything is moving around its environment, uh, you can do this in soil or water, uh, it's going to shed trace amounts of genetic material as it moves in, out into the environment. And so the goal of environmental DNA analysis is to collect samples, uh, in our situation water samples, and filter it through specialized filters that just catch the DNA, these microscopic elements. And so then we're going to use species specific primers to identify the DNA of just our target species in the sample. And so our primer was actually developed by uh, some biologists at the University of Maryland and with uh, the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center uh, that are just targeting uh, our river herring species here. And so the place where a lot of my experiments happened, uh, where we're going to answer most of these uh, hypotheses that we had to begin with, were at the Edenton National Fish Hatchery in Edenton, North Carolina. So this is a facility. Uh, it rears a number of sturgeon and striped bass yearly, along with some other species. And they were gracious enough to let us use, um, you see, uh, this one of these outbuildings in the picture. They have these large holding tanks, and they were... Uh, they we are very thankful they let us use their facilities in 2018 and 2019. Uh, in 2018, two experiments took place, uh, an abundant sampling experiment and a large scale time series. So in these, uh, this is one of the large holding tanks here. Uh, so in the abundant sampling, there was a set number of fish at the beginning and they added fish uh, at intervals of time to see as they added fish, how much environmental DNA was added with each increasing biomass of fish. And so we did this sampling uh, using 
this AND eDNA sampling backpack pictured here, and then a more traditional sampling where water was simply uh, collected in these nausea bottles and then filtered through using a pump uh, through the filter. And so these are the two methods that we were testing against each other. And so in 2018, all of these experiments happened in these large tanks. Uh, picture there is Dr. Rollison. Uh, he was one of my advisors for this project. Uh, he's doing a water sample collection there during the abundance sampling survey. So this is from our uh, abundance sampling survey, and this is also where the filter and backpack were compared. So using this traditional filter, we see um, exactly what would have been expected, this uptick uh, in DNA concentrations with the number of herring added. And with the backpack, it gets a little bit weirder. Uh, what we found with this um, eDNA sampling backpack is um, it's very convenient and works very well, but you know, depending on where in the water column your two collection tube is, you can get some differing results. Uh, so we can compare, look at a couple of our objectives already. So when you look at it, we did find that increasing numbers of blueback herring will equate to a larger concentration of that eDNA in a controlled environment. And so once normalized, the results from both sampling methods are within each other's margin of error, but it appears that the traditional method may still be the more reliable method in this case. Uh, so that was that abundance sampling survey uh, telling us about concentrations with increasing biomasses. Uh, now we can kind of start getting into the time series. So the reason that we went back in 2019 is that in 2018, we were unsure of some of our results. So what we expected was something like this graph here on the left. These are some expected results. This is what we thought we would get. And what we came up with on this right side is what we actually got in that 2018 time series in the 250 gallon tank. So as you can see, it's a little bit all over the place. There's not really many trends that you can see. And so we thought about this. Um, we tried to figure out why this might be. And our thought was maybe there are some mixing issues in this large tank. There's not much art agitation in these large tanks besides the fish themselves moving. So maybe this DNA is settling out, which isn't something we believe would really happen in a river system. We believe that this would constantly be moving. So one of our goals in 2019 was to take a look at using a smaller scale. So in this, we used one fish a piece in three smaller tanks that the water was constantly being agitated. So it is this more concentrated experiment, but looking at this time series, we got slightly more expected results. So this is what we, you know, looking at that expected results graph, this is a little bit closer to that. And so there were three tanks used. Uh, tank one had a medium, I mean, the fish were all approximately the same size and I have all that recorded, but this is just kind of a general description. Uh, tank one had an active fish that was medium sized. Tank two had a fish that was a little less active, but it was the smallest. And tank three had the largest fish and the fish had the least activity. So the fish were left in their tank for 48 hours and then removed and then DNA samples were taken at each point. We did triplicate samples from each tank at each time point. So using this, we were actually able to uh, make a preliminary shedding and decay rate. Uh, as I'll get to into in a minute, I think we need several more experiments to kind of confirm these numbers. Uh, we used an equation that was used from another institution to determine some uh, shedding and decay rates of freshwater mussel DNA. So what we found using this was we got a, a preliminary shedding rate of 1.63 times 10 to the negative third nanograms per liter per hour. And that our decay rate is 2.64 times 10 to the negative six nanograms per liter per hour. So, you know, small numbers, very small numbers as expected, but it's nice to have this preliminary rate because once we have the shedding and decay rates and we understand how things work in the environment, we can possibly use this methodology to take a sample and estimate uh, local fish populations using that. Uh, that still will be a ways away and will depend on a lot of future research, but that's um, our starting point. So using this 2019 smaller scale time series, 
uh, we can take a look at our objective of calculating those preliminary shedding and persistence rates. Uh, what it appears is that the increase in eDNA appears more exponential than linear, and the decrease once the fish was removed does not appear to be linear either. Uh, that's what you can kind of see with this, um, with these examples here. And we do believe that that fixed more of the mixing problem that we believe we had, but um, this is something that still needs to be addressed in future mesocosm experiments in the future. So just some notes on DNA persistence I wanted to add. Uh, this is why we're doing it in this closed environment. We can look at this under these controlled conditions. Um, in a river, you're not gonna have that. You're gonna have temperature differences, different microbes, water parameter differences. And it appears that higher temperature and higher microbial loads lead to faster degradation. And uh, a more acidic pH also leads to faster degradation of environmental DNA. And water turbulence appears to have no effect. Uh, obviously, that's going to move the, move the environmental DNA around, but it's not actually going to have any effect on the degradation rate, this persistence rate. Uh, the second part of this work that I did for this project was actual river sampling. So there were two rivers that were sampled um, the year before I got on the project that I'll talk about a little bit, but we're going to focus more on um, the rivers that I looked at for my project. And so um, there were five sites on the Noose River, two that were sampled in, focused mostly sampled on in 2018 and then three that were sampled on 2019 on the Noose River, and then three on the Tar River. And so these are the 2018 results um, that were before my time. Uh, this sampling was done by NC DNR uh, biologists who were out actually electrofishing along with uh, the eDNA sampling results. So this is an interesting situation where we actually get to look at um, river heron counts along with um, eDNA concentration. So we're getting to compare these in the environment. And we can see some trends. It almost looks like this eDNA concentration seems to follow the incoming of fish. So maybe as the fish go up, there's that delay in this detection. And that's something we see in Village Creek uh, in these years. And here it is in Core Creek. So it looks like later on in the seasons when we're getting these eDNA spikes, possibly after the fish came in. Uh, we believe that the fish probably came in in larger numbers before this first sampling date. And so they're farther upstream, so all this is coming downstream. Uh, another possible explanation for this besides just fish presence might be, um, you know, these are anadromous fish that come into the rivers to mate. So this could be genetic material flowing downstream um, from these activities. Uh, and we see this in Cork Creek in 2019 as it's, actually interesting because later on in the season we're seeing less river herring but we still are getting that presence so that could be from fish further upstream uh, but now we'll get on to my 2019 sampling uh, this is from the tar river and the noose river so our three three sites on the tar river in 2019 were town creek canedo creek and tranters creek so uh, as you can see from the map here town creek and canedo creek are slightly farther upstream and Tranters Creek is farther downstream. And what's interesting is when you look at Town Creek and Canedo Creek, we kind of can see this trend happening where, you know, we have these higher levels of eDNA concentration uh, on the 24th and 29th of March in those two weeks. And then these very similar shorter bars uh, the next following three weeks. And you can see it a bit in the Tranters Creek uh, site, but not quite the same. So it's interesting that these we're seeing trends depending on how far the creeks are from the sound itself as the fish are coming in. And we can see some similar things uh, on the Noose River. So we uh, sampled at Contentnia Creek, Trent River, and Lawson Creek sites. Uh, and just for note, um, these samplings were done for the sake of simplicity uh, from access areas, easy access, such as bridges or docks that go out into the river, uh, boat ramps. So that would involve less boat work. You know, we're trying to simplify this process so samples can be taken easily for easier monitoring. So what we see is we kind of can see this trend again with these further upstream sites when we ever look at um, the Contentia and Trent River sites. Uh, we see these higher bars these higher concentrations at the beginning of the sampling season. 
and some lower bars towards the end. And we also see that in Lawson Creek to a degree. So these trends are definitely coming forward in this. So it appears that this should be more applicable once we figure out how all these river conditions are affecting the DNA. We should be able to eventually, theoretically, make a methodology for simpler sampling and monitoring using eDNA for these species, uh, most likely alongside traditional sampling. But you know, you never know in the future. Maybe it will be as simple as the sampling is all taking place from environmental DNA sampling. And so this is kind of all of it put together, um, including this arrow showing inland to seaward uh, sites. So once you have it all big picture here, you can really start to see these trends. And so this is actually um, what we're going forward and comparing to our objective. Uh, our hypothesis was that they would vary in different locations and times. And so we sort of see that, but we're also seeing that high eDNA concentrations can remain after the fish are no longer in the immediate area. And that's what we're seeing from those core and village creek sites, those comparisons we were making. Uh, so just some quick conclusions on, uh, based on these objectives and hypotheses and this work that was done. Uh, we're seeing that more biomass does mean higher DNA concentrations as expected. Uh, we're finding that shedding, crate, shedding rate is much more rapid than the decay rate. And that there may be similarities in river systems of eDNA concentrations based on how far the creeks are inland, how far they are from the sites that the fish are entering the rivers at. And what we're finding is that in a controlled environment, like in our mesocosm experiments, uh, river herring eDNA appears to be shed an exponential rate. Uh, but even more controlled tank tiles would be good to better understand decay. Uh, we're still not entirely sure about that decay rate from these preliminary rates. Um, luckily, there are more people that came into East Carolina University um, after my time who are still there who are further working on this environmental DNA project. Um, we have a publication we're working on right now uh, using some of this data, and they're also um, running some new statistical tests on it, which is one of my future directions that I believe this project needs to take. So um, these are my opinion on some future directions for the project. Uh, I believe that more of these small scale time series experiments where the water is well mixed uh, could be done to focus more specifically on um, the decay rate of river herring eDNA. And further experiments on how different water quality parameters are affecting um, the shedding and decay rates. I know that there's um, a lot of work going on in this right now, testing different parameters, different species, um, all sorts of different things. This is environmental DNA is has great potential for sampling and monitoring, um, especially for cryptic or imperiled species that are hard to find. Uh, presence and absence, we know eDNA does a very good job of, but we're trying to do more of this quantitative methodology. Uh, weekly environmental sampling could be extended into other NC river systems. Um, like we said, this just focused on the, um, the noose and the Tar River. Uh, there has been some pilot work done in the Chuan River, but that's not too developed yet. But we'd also like to look at the Roanoke and the Cape Fear River. Uh, further statistical analysis on our existing data would definitely be uh, be a good step in the right direction. Uh, I've done some statistical analysis uh, that I included in my thesis, but uh, statistical analysis is a big thing that needs to be focused on in this data. That was one of our um, problems when we submitted our publication was more statistical analysis uh, was definitely a big want. And then experiments focusing on larva or um, river herring genetic material really during mating, I believe that that would even provide an even better perspective and understanding of how these river herring are affecting eDNA concentrations because we're working on adult fish here. Um, adult fish are not, obviously not the only ones putting DNA in the environment. So a better understanding of different stages of the life cycle uh, would obviously provide a deeper understanding of how herring presence is affecting the eDNA concentrations. Um, I'd like to acknowledge all those that contributed to this research uh, real quick. Um, first of all, since I'm here, I'd like to start off by thanking uh, NOAA Central Library and the uh, Potomac chapter of the American Fishery Society for their support uh, in this. Um, I'd like to thank my advisors from East Carolina University, Dr. Aaron Field, Dr. Roger Rolison, and Dr. Michael Brewer. Uh, 
I'd like to thank our colleagues at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center and University of Maryland for primer development and continued support throughout the project. Uh, NOAA and North Carolina Sea Grant for some funding support. Uh, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and the NC Wildlife Resource Commission for their help with some um, sample collection. Uh, and of course, uh, our friends at the Eaton National Fish Hatchery who helped us set up everything. They were constantly checking in to make sure we had everything we needed. It was a great place to do research. Uh, and some of my uh, colleagues from the field lab who assisted with collection, statistics, uh, processing of samples, all of it. Um, I couldn't have done this without um, the huge number of people listed here. And um, I'd just like to end by saying thank you for get, be giving, thanks again for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. And um, thank you for listening. Great, thank you so much, Seth. Um, we're gonna move on to Vasker's talk, but everyone please stick around. If you have questions for Seth, he will answer those at the end. Um, so I'm going to switch it over to Vasker to present his talk. All right, uh, I hope you can hear me. <clears throat> um, thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Vaskar Nepal, and I am a, a brand new assistant professor at Western Illinois University. Uh, this work uh, actually uh, happened when I was a student at Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Um, this work is based on blue catfish. Uh, this was the work that I got the uh, travel award from Potomac River Chapter 4, so that's what I would present today. Uh, before I get started, I want to just thank my co-authors, uh, Mary Fabrizio, Troy Taki, and Maggie Dillon, but also a whole host of other people, uh, both at VIMS and elsewhere, who supported me uh, in person, in kind, with money, with funding, whatever, um, especially C. Grant, who supported my, uh, supported my research as well. So uh, I will specifically talk about uh, the salinity tolerance of invasive blue catfish, but the motivation for this work essentially comes from blue catfish being an invasive species. And invasive species, as you all know, are harmful to our ecosystems. In Chesapeake Bay alone, there are a whole host of invasive species from Phragmites and emerald ash borer to, uh, to some mussels and uh, crabs and snakeheads and a bunch of different species. Today we'll focus on blue catfish, which you might know is actually native to the Mississippi River Basin, uh, Mississippi, uh, Ohio, and Missouri River Basins. The native uh, range is shown here in orange. And in the native region, blue catfish are a big deal. And you can probably tell why. They get big. And this guy, for example, suddenly looks very happy to have captured a blue catfish, right? So there is, there is definitely value uh, that blue catfish provides as far as recreational and trophy fishery. But also if you are in the Midwest and especially if you are in the South, blue catfish is also famous for the Southern fried catfish. Just, just look at that. I mean, looking at that makes my mouth water, right? Just, uh, yeah, it, it is a very important uh, cultural icon in the Midwest and in the South. So people elsewhere thought, you know, there is this awesome species, it's called blue catfish in the Midwest and in the South. We should bring that here because, you know, it's awesome. So that's what people did. Blue catfish has been brought to a lot of places throughout the country. The brown areas here show the uh, places where blue catfish have been introduced. Uh, but uh, you will note that specifically blue catfish have been introduced to the Chesapeake Bay region shown by uh, that, uh, th that blue uh, rectangle, and that's where uh, my study focused on. So let's look at that. Blue catfish were introduced to the Rapp, Henrik, York, and the James Rivers uh, in the Chesapeake Bay region in the 1970s and 80s to create a recreational fishery. The stocking locations are highlighted by those green triangles, but since then they have expanded quite a bit in range. The brown areas here show where blue catfish exist now, and you note that they exist in a lot of places. They have expanded in range, uh, not only within the systems that they were introduced in, but also to other systems throughout the Bay. 
in addition to this range expansion, there has also been an increase in the population size. <clears throat> Let's look at the population density of blue catfish in two of these rivers. The Wims Juvenile Fish Trawl Survey uh, has been collecting fish from these rivers for, uh, for over 50 years. And uh, I'm showing the index of abundance for blue catfish for two rivers, the James River in green solid line and the York River in the dashed uh, purple bluish line. Uh, you note that the index of abundance has increased quite a bit in both James River and the York River. For York River, it's not as clear, but that's mostly because of the scale, because of how much higher the abundance is in the James River. But if we just focus on the York River, we will see that the abundance has increased quite a bit in the York River as well. Now, over the last 30 years or so, the index of abundance uh, in the James and York Rivers for blue catfish increased. At the same time, the index of abundance for the white catfish, which is the native catfish, declined in both of these rivers. Coincidence? We think not, because it could be that they, uh, blue catfish might be outcompeting white catfish because they eat similar kinds of foods, they live in similar kinds of habitats. Um, so blue catfish may have negative effects on the local animals uh, via competition. But also predation. This figure shows the stomach contents of blue catfish, relatively large blue catfish from the James River. Uh, this only shows the fish uh, items found in the diet of the fish, uh, diet of the blue catfish. Um, what I want you to note here is that there are a lot of species that are of concern. For example, American eel, American shad, and blueback herring. These are organisms that we are trying to protect. We want these organisms to, to, uh, to increase, but blue catfish are feeding on these animals, and that's not good. Now, you might be thinking, well, look at that. I mean, those numbers are really small, so it's probably not that bad. And I mean, it would be right if blue catfish population was pretty small. So that's the next question. Is the blue catfish population big? Fabrizio et al. did a study, uh, and here's, the, here's a quote from the abstract from that study. This says, the blue catfish population in the 12 kilometer study area was estimated to be 1.6 million fish. So as you can see, that's a lot of fish. That is a lot of fish in a small stretch of the river. So yeah, even if blue catfish eat small amounts of these imperial fish, total overall with the size of the population that blue catfish has, the total impact can be quite huge. And that's exactly why now people are increasingly concerned about where blue catfish are going to end up. Are they going to end up in the main stream of the bay itself, for example? Because that would not be good. If they expand to the main stream of the bay, they might have negative impacts on our estuarine animals that we try to protect. For example, the crabs, the oysters, what have you. We do not want that. So how do we know whether blue catfish can expand to the main stream of the bay? To me, the most important factor that might affect that is salinity. Uh, this is probably just a recap for uh, most of you, maybe all of you, but Chesapeake Bay, by virtue of being an estuary, has a salinity gradient. As you move towards the south and as you move towards the east, the bay feeds into the ocean and so the salinity increases. So there is a salinity gradient. And this is an important factor because Salinity is a tremendous stressor. Fish, this goes back to the idea of osmoregulation, right? Which is the maintenance of internal balance of salt and water. Very briefly, here's how this works. On the left-hand side, I have fresh water, so zero parts per thousand. On the right-hand side, I have seawater, so 34 parts per thousand. So the color gradient just shows how much salt is in the medium. Now imagine a freshwater fish. I colored it a little bit darker on the inside because it has more salt inside the body of the fish than outside, okay? What that means is water will continuously flood in to prevent that the fish does not drink any water and produces a lot of dilute urine. It also actively uptakes the salts through the gills and skin and such. If this fish were to swim to seawater, now that's what I, is going to happen, I did not change the color of the fish, but now look at that. 
the color of the, uh, the, the salt concentration inside is now actually lower than the seawater, which means that the water is constantly rushing out. So the fish has to make up for that by drinking a lot of water. It produces a small amount of concentrated urine and actively pumps out the salts. So can the fish move from one side, one, one phase from fresh water to salt water and change this mechanism completely? Most fish cannot do that. And that is what gives uh, you know, species richness curves like this one. This shows the freshwater rich species richness uh, over different salinities based on the classic figure by Rimani. And what you note is that, uh, you know, at relatively higher salinities, blue uh, most freshwater species do not really exist because most freshwater species cannot really tolerate higher salinities. The question now is, where along this continuum is blue catfish? Is it highly tolerant of salinity? Not so much tolerant of salinity? That's what we sought to find out. So the objectives of my study were to test the effects of increased salinity on survival and vital rates of blue catfish, and then eventually use that to evaluate the potential for blue catfish to expand into estuarine habitats of Chesapeake Bay. Um, this essentially includes two studies. Both of these were published in PLOS One uh, uh, with the same authors just a year apart. So it kind of looks like it's the same paper, but these are two different papers. So let's let's see what we did. Uh, we used the Vimps Juvenile Fish Cross Survey as a sampling platform. We went out and collected uh, blue catfish brought them live to the lab and conducted a classic 72-hour LC50 study. So we exposed fish to a bunch of different salinities going from about uh, zero parts per thousand, which is fresh water, all the way to 27 parts per thousand, which is pretty close to uh, full strength seawater. For each of those tanks, we added 10 individual blue catfish and slowly increase the salinity over the next seven hours or so. And then we started monitoring when they died, if they died at all. And here's what we found. Let's just look at the left-hand panel first. On the x-axis, I'm showing fork length, and on the y-axis, I'm showing median time to death for females on the left-hand panel, okay? So uh, each of those lines correspond to different salinities. So if we look at this top line, that's for 17 parts per thousand. So let's just look at that line. What this is saying is that as fork length increases, the median time to death increases as well. What that means is that bigger fish take longer to die. Bigger fish do not die as fast as the small fish do. So that's one. The second thing you note is that as you go down, the salinity increases, right? So 17 to 19 to 21, 23. What that means is at higher salinities, fish die sooner. So that part is not surprising, right? Blue catfish are freshwater fish, so they probably cannot tolerate high salinities. The higher the salinity, the less they can tolerate it. But the second part with the uh, big fish being able to tolerate salinity longer, that is interesting and that has important implications. And that is something that we actually saw for male fish as well. So this is what we observed from the lab. Is this what we observe in the field? Luckily, we have data to look into that, uh, that very question. So the WIMS juvenile fish trawl survey, as I said, has been collecting blue catfish for uh, ever since blue catfish were introduced in these systems. So we have a lot of data, and this here I'm showing the data for the Rap and Hennock River. On the x-axis, I'm showing salinity, and on the y-axis, fork length. Each of those dots are individual blue catfish that were collected. So that, that line that you see in the middle, in the middle is the median uh, quantile regression line, okay? So the main thing to note here is that at uh, higher salinities, so say greater than 10 parts per thousand, we really do not see small fish. What that means is most fish, re most small fish cannot really tolerate low salinities. 
they can tolerate uh, high salinities. They can tolerate low salinities just fine because we are seeing a bunch of them here. But small fish really cannot tolerate high salinities. And that's a pattern we see in the York River and the, in the James River as well. So support from both the lab and the field data. Now going back to the lab experiment, um, we also fit some logistic regression models and uh, one of the results is shown here with salinity in the x-axis and predicted survival in the y-axis. So uh, what we observed is that at low salinities, most fish did not really die. The predicted probability of survival was high, really one. And then at about 13 or 14 parts per thousand, fish started dying. And then by about 20 parts per thousand or so, all the fish were dead within 72 hours. The, the uh, LC50 value, 72 hour LC50 value came out to be 15.7 parts per thousand, which is uh, the predictors, which is the salinity where the predictor survival is 0 0.5. And that's the traditional way to look at uh, the salinity tolerance of fish species. So how does this compare to other fish species, other species in general? Remember Romani plot that I showed before? So along this continuum, blue catfish is here. So yeah, blue catfish can tolerate pretty high salinity compared to most freshwater fish species, it seems like. And that is really not good for us. We can also use that logistic regression plot from before to make predictions about the survival of blue catfish throughout the Chesapeake Bay. So here, during the wet months, I'm showing the salinity uh, profile in throughout the Chesapeake Bay. This is sort of like the figure that I showed before. When you combine with the logistic regression from before, this is what we get. This shows the probability of survival. Um, and here's how you would read this map. Um, red is where salinity is too high. So the fish will not be able to survive for more than 72 hours. Light blue is where salinity is low enough that blue catfish can survive there on average for more than 72 hours. So during these wet months, what you note is that blue catfish can actually survive in pretty much all these rivers, but also a huge part of the upper bay. In fact, at this time, blue catfish may also be able to expand from one sub-estuary to another, and from there to another, and so on. Blue catfish may even, to, even be able to move from one side of the estuary to another side. And uh, so this essentially says that a lot of Chesapeake Bay, blue cat, uh, Chesapeake Bay might be vulnerable to expansion of blue catfish, especially during the wet months and wet years, and especially because of large individuals, because those are the individuals that can tolerate high salinity for longer, okay? All right, so that was one. Um, now I will show another experiment for sublethal effects. This is experiment three because the, um, the previous experiment was actually conducted in two parts. But here's what we did. Last time we looked at mortality, but the fish not dying does not mean that there are no negative effects. So what might be sublethal effects? So that's what we looked at here. Here I'm showing essentially the design with uh, where we have essentially uh, four different salinities going from one parts per thousand to ten parts per thousand. Uh, we measured some traits in these fish at the start of the experiment and once every four weeks for 16 weeks, so essentially four months. Here's what we observed. So I'm showing salinity in the x-axis and growth rate in the y-axis. And what we found was that uh, fish grew in all cases. That's the first thing because all these values are positive. The second thing is the growth rate was highest at four parts per thousand and lowest at 10 parts per thousand. 10 parts per thousand is kind of understandable, I guess, because that is, after all, the highest salinity and blue catfish are freshwater fish. But this four parts per thousand is a little bit surprising because on the one hand, you might think that blue catfish might do best at one parts per thousand because that's closest to freshwater, which is what they where they live. On the other hand, it might be uh, they might you might expect that they might do best at about seven parts per thousand or something because that's closest to their isosmotic uh, salinity, and I'll talk about that briefly soon. <clears throat> 
so around four parts per thousand is where uh, the, the habitats around that is where uh, Chesapeake Bay is most vulnerable. That's what we found. Especially when you consider the consumption rates, you realize that at one parts per thousand, blue catfish eat the most. At four parts per thousand, they eat quite a bit lower, but still they grew fastest. Why is that? Well, again, going back to osmo regulation, there is an intermediate salinity where the internal concentration and the outside concentration are about the same, and that's called the isosmotic line. That happens to be at about nine parts per thousand and where uh, the energetic costs for osmo regulation are uh, supposed to be minimized. So that is where blue catfish you would expect to do the best. That is not what we found. So really, why the best growth at four parts per thousand instead of seven parts per thousand? After all, seven parts per thousand is the closest to nine parts per thousand, the isosmotic line. So what gives? Well, to check that, we are we recently conducted another experiment looking at uh, respirometry, where we exposed fish to different salinities and measured their metabolic rates. And now we are combining that with bioenergetics modeling specifically uh, dynamic energy budget modeling to uh, essentially see what is happening internally from the energetics perspective. So we are looking into that. I have some results for that, but I'm not go really going to show that just uh, for the sake of time, but feel free to ask me questions about that later on. So just to summarize, uh, blue catfish have pretty high salinity tolerance, allowing them to expand into other rivers. And we found that blue catfish have large, uh, larger individuals are more tolerant of salinity. And so these individuals might be the ones that, uh, that might expand into more, uh, uh, expand into other habitats or expand or even permanently live at high salinity waters. Around four parts per thousand, it seems like is uh, are the habitats that are most vulnerable uh, to blue catfish. So what are the implications? We already knew that blue catfish have large population sizes and densities. They're opportunistic generalist feeders. And now we know that blue catfish are able to tolerate high salinities. Combine all of that and you find that blue catfish may be able to alter estuarine ecosystem structure and function, potentially causing a loss of ecosystem services, unless the managers are pretty strict about managing blue catfish. What can be done? Well, one idea is invasive voyeurism. Uh, if you can't beat them, eat them. So that's essentially the idea there. Um, but increasing the, uh, the, the harvest of the species has some hurdles. One is, first of all, there is low harvest. Second, there are contaminants, uh, contaminant loads and advisories because of that. Uh, there is also the tricky situation with the USDA regulation. Uh, that is going to take another hour to explain, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. Uh, but there is also comp competing management interests. Some people want to maintain the trophy fishery, while some of us uh, more conservation-oriented people might want to reduce the population of blue catfish so that the negative effects on the local animals can be decreased. So there, there are competing management interests as well. But, you know, there, is, there are enough blue catfish where we can probably make, uh, at least come to some kind of compromise and make blue catfish both uh, trash and treasure. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, what, uh, that's what we should seek to do. And with that, I will take any questions. You can reach me at uh, that email address shown there. That's my newer email address. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them for you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Basker and Seth, for your awesome talks here. I am going to uh, turn it over to the audience now to see if anyone has some questions. I will be looking at the question panel for those questions. And while people are typing their questions, I'm going to see if Lee or Julie have any questions that they want to ask. I don't have any questions right now, but I really enjoyed the talks and appreciate uh, the willingness of Seth and Vasco to <clears throat> share their research and how 
the support from the American Fishery Society of Potomac chapter help them to share their work with their colleagues in the fisheries field. And again, the American Fishery Society of Potomac chapter is the local subunit of the American Fishery Society in the Washington, D.C. area. So if anyone's interested in getting more involved, please let myself or Julie know. Thanks. Julie, is there anything you wanted to say? No, I just wanted to thank Baskar and Seth again because um, it was great to hear their research again. Um, both have really cool projects and um, I think they have um, a lot of relevance to our area. So thank you guys for being able to do this for us today. Um, so I will let, turn it over to any questions that the uh, attendees might have. Great, thank you. We do have a question come in for Vasker, so uh, I will read that off. Great work. Uh, it seems that several years ago, it was thought that blue catfish salinity tolerance was much lower, but over time, and thanks to your good work, we have come to learn that they can tolerate higher salinities. Are we to believe that the salinities you identified are their wall, in quotes, or do they have the ability to adapt over time to even higher salinities? Um, great question. So uh, I think part of the answer comes from the question itself. Uh, we, you know, the reason pe people, I don't think, realize that blue caps may have such high salinities. That's why they were brought here in the first place, right? Because the, the biologists did not really think that that was possible, but then it is. Uh, right now, my thinking is that blue catfish may not necessarily have uh, have the the physiological ab ability to uh, go too much higher than uh, their current uh, salinity tolerance but there is something to be said about uh, maternal effects so if the fish are you know they, they hatch here and the mother has been here the the mother fish has been here for uh, a long long time and um, some of those traits might be transferred to uh, to the offspring. I do not know whether that is the case with salinity tolerance. I have not seen any research on that for on any fish species, but for a lot of other traits that has been shown. So it is possible. Um, I, I really think that a huge part of it is just experience, though. Experience meaning experience of an individual fish. Uh, over its lifetime and the size of the fish, especially the size of the fish is critical because uh, that is a strong uh, strong factor that affects you know how lo how much uh, salinity a blue catfish can tolerate. Thank you so much, Vasker. Uh, I now have a, a question for Seth. Um, Seth, since you were uh, mentioning uh, collection methods, for your for the sampling on the rivers were boat docks and uh, bridges is there any concerns with contamination at those sites um, with folks having possibly other other species of fish that are not uh, maybe found directly in that area um, contaminating those samples so that was a um a concern that we had but um so when I say things like um, boat docks and such, most of our examples were really bridges. There was a boat dock or two. Um, what we think right now is that, you know, some people do use, you know, some species similar to these species as bait for fish, like catfish actually. So um, although there is a moratorium, uh, on the specific two target species in North Carolina. So in theory, they really shouldn't be there and contaminating results, but it's always a possibility. Um, we just believe that it's not that big of an issue because most of our sites are, you know, bridges and such. So we don't really think people are bringing in anything outside into those areas really. Great, thank you, Seth. 
Uh, I am not seeing any other questions, so unless someone is typing furiously, I'm going to give everybody another 30 seconds and ask you both, is there something, uh, since we have about five minutes, is there something in your presentations that you wanted to say but you didn't think you would have time to say? Um, what, would you, what would you like to add? And I'm going to call names. Vaskar, you go first. <laughs> sure. I would just say, um, and I think I echo uh, a lot of biologists' feelings around this reason anyway. We need to uh, we need to uh, do something about you know increasing the harvest of these fish, increasing consumption because money uh, you know fish in the water is money in the water, right? So if we can harvest more fish. It is uh, beneficial in many, many different ways. Uh, there is livelihood, people, uh, people can earn some money. It is better for the environment. Uh, even the contaminant load uh, on the individual fish will likely decrease because uh, the growth of the fish will increase. So uh, yeah, we just need to find ways to eat more catfish and you know distribute more, distribute more catfish, just increase the market of blue catfish. So, yeah, we, we just need to spread the word. Great, that sounds that sounds good. It is uh, National Seafood Month, so I think we can we can start with there. Start there, um, Seth. I do want you to answer that question, but we did have a separate question come in for you. Um, did you use the same type of filter for the Smith root um, and Nalgene samples? So that is an interesting one. Uh, so that's something that was different um, due to the fact that uh, I believe that the, so with the Smith root system, for each sample you're usually, you're using um, a separate packet. So a packet consists of um, the filter and the housing that goes on the end of the tube to sample with. So those just came with one specific size filter, which was different than the one that we used for the Nalgene bottles. Uh, and that could affect some changes. Um, that's another downside actually to the backpack unit is that um, all of that is disposable, which is very sterile, uh, which is very important in any sort of sampling. But at the same time, um, it does produce a lot of extra plastic waste when we do that. So that was another, uh, concern related to that that I just thought of. But um, yeah, they are different size filters actually. Good to know. And uh, what what would you say uh, as your as your final parting uh, note for folks? Uh, I guess as a final parting note, uh, the big thing that I wish I had known more when I was um, actually doing this work that I've learned more uh, now that I've taken this turn into social science is um. One important thing to do is listen to the people. Uh, you know, everywhere I went when I was doing the sampling, there were fishermen out who were telling me all sorts of things. And, you know, I feel like there's probably a little bit of that impulse to stick just to what you know from the books, what you know from the science. Um, you can't always do that. There's knowledge that people who are actually experiencing things know that you might never get. So um, that's one big thing that I've definitely learned since then and would go back and try to incorporate more. Great, thank you so much, Seth and Vasker. Um, these were wonderful talks and we had a great audience here. Um, we do have oh, one minute, so I'm gonna wrap this up for everybody and remind them uh, we did record this. It'll be up on the, the YouTube channel and I wanna thank uh, Lee and Julie also for uh, uh, presenting with us today. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you.